for anybody who's from Bangalore or is coming to Bangalore from the outside, a few things are a constant, like great institutions such as Koshis or things like weather, which everybody enjoys. There's not any discrimination involved when it comes to things about Bangalore and Karnataka, which everybody enjoys equally. The state itself has had a magnificent history and the city itself is approaching towards a 500 year history in 2037. Now, as far as this history is concerned, there's been a lot of struggle. There's been a lot of constants. There's been a lot of letdowns. But as a civilization and as a population and as a society, we've always strived. Now, this is the entire journey of the city and the state that we are going to discuss with two of the authors of a comprehensive economic report which envisions Karnataka as a trillion dollar economy very soon in the early 2030s. I'm joined by Dr. Mohandas Pai and Nisha Holla who've written a magnificent report for the first time which probably envisions the nitty gritties of the Karnataka economy and how it needs to be placed going forward in the future. Hello, a very good evening. Sir, ma'am, thank you so much for joining us and giving us this time to discuss this comprehensive uh, report that you've put together. Uh, I think this comes at a very important uh, junction in the history of India, especially because India is touching 75 years of its independence and the government is out to celebrate Azadi Kam Dut Mahotsav. As far as Karnataka and Bengaluru is concerned, Bengaluru as a city will turn 500 years by 2037. And uh, the state also is gearing up for elections. There's BBMP elections coming. So I think there are multiple occasions where this fits in. But as an economic report, especially since the world and the country and the state has gone through a pandemic, uh, you know, why did you think that it was very important at this point of time? And why, are you, why have you come out with this report? If you could just brief me about that. So I think if you look at the macroeconomic environment, right? Uh, India is at a, as you said, India, to, India is at a very important juncture. Uh, it's, it'll be, it's now the fifth largest economy in the world. We are at $3.16 trillion. We recently surpassed the United Kingdom. And only two countries have gone past the $10 trillion ceiling. That's the United States at $24 trillion and China at nearly $20 trillion. After that, you have Japan and Germany at $5 trillion. So India is now looking in the next decade to reach $5 trillion quickly and then $10 trillion. And we're supposed, we are touted as the only economy in the world who can reach 10 trillion next because of our demographic advantage, open market economics, technology adoption, so many factors gearing up there, right? So according to our conservative estimates, you know, if India keeps growing at the rate it is, in a nominal growth rate at 12%, we can reach $5 trillion by 2026 and then $10 trillion by 2032. So in that uh, macroeconomic environment, if you look at Karnataka, Karnataka is one of the top five economies in India. It's been for a long time. Currently, we're at number three. We're, I think, the only state economy in India that has a per capita income of over three lakhs. Uh, our uh, services component of the uh, of the economy is very high. It's at 66%. So we have all these factors coming together, which, which propels Karnataka to become $1 trillion very quickly. Right. So we're looking at reaching these goals. Currently, we are $273 billion we can reach maybe 500 billion when uh, India reaches 5 trillion, maybe 1 trillion when uh, India reaches 10 trillion dollars. So this is this decade is, as it is India's decade, it's kind of Karnataka's decade because we have all these factors coming together. And so we thought this report uh, is coming at a crucial time for Karnataka to be reaching these goals. The way we came about this report actually is very interesting. Uh, the uh, Karnataka is one of the few states in India that uh, publishes an economic survey, just like India does. And so the planning department this year, they created, they had a one of a kind exercise in India where they invited experts to come and write these chapters instead of the government writing chapters. So we were also invited to write, uh, to contribute two chapters to the economic survey, state of the economy and the conclusion chapter. And so we took those two chapters and we kind of worked with the planning department as well uh, to update this data, update our analysis and come out with this report. So we're very happy to present this report to the government and we're also working with the government to, uh, you know, take the findings of this report forward. So it's a very exciting time for us also, I think, as authors to come out yes, with indeed. this report. How much do you think uh, uh, it is in terms of a story when compared to other states? Every story has its own 
uh, every state has its own story of success in that sense. And you have an economic vision for Karnataka which perhaps is set in the early 30s and that is when we touch the 1 trillion mark, uh, hopefully. Uh, as compared to the other states, how, how and where do you think we are placed as an economy in terms of you know, the comparison between the South Indian states itself for that matter? Because a lot of the parameters are drawn in, in, in some of the studies that uh, you've placed in the report. You see, if you look at economic data, Karnataka is a very unique state compared to any other state. The top state is Maharashtra. Yeah. Now, Maharashtra has a large manufacturing base, which somewhat has shifted to Gujarat. And Maharashtra has Bombay as a financial center. But Maharashtra does not have a big knowledge economy in technology. Right. Even though Bombay and Pune are doing well, that vision and understanding in Maharashtra doesn't seem to exist based on the dialogue they have and what they're doing. And Maharashtra as a big state is going through political issues with multiple governments, etc. You'll be surprised that we prepared a $1 trillion strategy plan for Maharashtra, met okay. uh, Chief Minister Fadnaves, gave it to him, and he promised that he comes back to power and set up a group and do it. Because obviously, yeah. as the biggest economy in India among the state, Maharashtra has to lead. But it didn't work out. Then you look at Gujarat. Gujarat, I think, has about 40-45% of its GDP coming from industry. Gujarat has done very well in the industrial economy. Now, we are in the services and knowledge economy which depends on human capital and Gujarat is somewhat underinvested in human capital. Right. I think the services part of Gujarat is about 35% or so. It's quite low compared to other state. And today, manufacturing is getting automated. Right. You can have a 10,000 crore plant come up, you could create 1,000 jobs which they automated. And those 1,000 jobs may not uh, go to Gujaratis because you require very sophisticated understanding of automation. Right. Then you have jobs which are very mundane jobs. Maybe they don't want to work on that. So you will get uh, labor, contract labor from Bihar, Jharkhand to do that work. So where do they leave Gujarat? They'll have huge investment figures, but employment will not, high quality employment will not go up. Where does high quality employment come? At the top end of manufacturing and in services. And the services sector is not developed in Gujarat. Look at Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu has done well, but I think over the last 10 years they lost the way. Uh, because you know manufacturing is very good in Tamil Nadu, services have come up. But if you look at the political rhetoric, look at what they're talking, they just don't seem to get it. Even though Chief Minister Stalin has said, I'll be a $1 trillion economy, blah, blah, blah. I got this. And the finance minister said, I got Raghuram Rajan and uh, no, Abhijit Banerjee, who are to tell you. They, these are not the experts who understand how economy works to go to $1 trillion, Right? They're all poverty economists. They know how to accelerate poverty because, you know, poverty acceleration, keeping poverty intact gives them the kind of you know, Political talking power, right. like, like uh, the journal that the social scientist Salvador <laughs> just spoke about. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at Karnataka, Karnataka has grown because of Bangalore. 66 percent of GDP is, uh, you know, Bangalore, uh, is services. And Bangalore is 60 percent of GDP of Karnataka. 25 percent of the GDP comes from technology. And uh, Karnataka is leading. And Bangalore has demonstrated that this can go. Uh, this can uh, be the way forward. Right. So, and is the richest state in India in terms of per capita income. Even during the COVID, it did very well because the service economy, which is externally linked, right. did extremely well. So, Karnataka has got everything going for it. Uh, good people, uh, pol politics, which is not as extreme as Tamil Nadu possibly and maybe Maharashtra. And, uh, you know, a very yeah. uh, enlightened middle class. You know, out right. of 1.11 million people, 1.1 crore people in Bangalore, about 21 lakh work in technology. About 40 lakhs are employed. And these are highly educated people. There are 1 lakh PhDs in Bangalore. Education center, high tech center, Bangalore leads. And the future is going to be in innovation and high tech. And so Karnataka has the best chance to do it. But we have to reorient our strategy. Economic thinking in Karnataka is still steeped in the rural sector, in uh, villages and in agriculture, etc. And they have to shift, even though uh, technology has done very well and services the leading indicator. In political circles, the dialogue about this is not there, except uh, looking at it as a curiosity. Yeah. I mean, you were very surprised. One minister <laughs> who was minister for Bangalore in the earlier governments uh, had not gone to the outer ring road. Anybody going to the outer ring roads, looking at all the names of the companies, will be extremely proud. Yeah. I don't think there's any one street anywhere in the world which has so many great global companies. He has never been there. And we went there, he was very surprised. Oh, is it happening? <laughs> so I think the political uh, debate and rhetoric has to change. And getting this report right. together, presenting to them, creating this working group, re-wanting strategy, 
I think is an important thing for Karnataka. So for all the states right now, maybe Karnataka has the best chance to make this transition and lead India and become a role model. We've always looked at uh, certain economic visions at a national level, but I, I don't think the common man has ever felt connected at a state level. And I think when you just explain how important it is as a state for us to have that sort of a economic outlook going forward. And I think even I connected that because for a minute, even I was not envisioning that, you know, perhaps as a state, we need to get somewhere and there needs to be an economic roadmap. I have a lot of questions about what you just said, but before that, I was just hoping that both of you could summarize and uh, tell us the key features of the report and then we'll go forward. Yeah, before uh, N uh, Nisha wrote the report, so she will summarize it better. But I want mm. to make one point. I think today more money is spent by the states than the center. Right. Of the total spending of 70, 75 lakh crores between the center and the state, about I think uh, the larger part is 75% uh, 75 75 spending on development is by the states. Okay. The state spending is much more. Right. The role of the government of India has come down. 42% of the revenues collected there, excluding custom duty, goes to the states. Right. So what impacts your life and my life is the state government. Right. The central government will create interstate connectivity policies. But in execution and quality of life, this is what happens and the states have to grow. And over a period of time, there's a great divergence among all the states. Look at West Bengal, it's lost. Yeah. West Bengal is the biggest econo economy in the country after independence. It's totally lost. I mean, the GER in West Bengal today is something like 19. 19%. GER in Bihar is 13. UP has done very well. Madhya Pradesh has done very well in agriculture. Right? Orissa is doing very well because of his mineral wealth. So there is a divergence among all the states. Each state is doing something very well and you know, doing it very differently. If you want to know industry, Gujarat has done extremely well. Yes. Agriculture, it is Madhya Pradesh, not Punjab. Madhya Pradesh is the powerhouse for India. It's grown 21% CHGR over multiple years, right? right? And if you want services, it's Karnataka, right? So yes. very different states have done different things. And we believe that the states will take predominance in India. Even though today, economic rhetoric and all the yellow papers write about Delhi and everything else, we must focus on the state. And for us, living in Bangalore, Karnataka is important. Bangalore is important. This is our life. Yeah. Delhi is far away. Delhi is far away, like they said, in China for many years in the emperor's rule. The emperor is far away in Beijing. Right. Right? Yeah. So, you know, for us, this state has to grow. The state can show a model which is very different. And that's what Nisha has worked to explain. Yeah, I mean, we've always had the concept of decentralized power and institutions, uh, but in a political sense. But in an economic sense, perhaps it's See, the it's state government has to lead. Time. Yeah. I see the Tamil Nadu finance minister criticizing government. But you must ask yeah. him the question, what is he doing? He's got the largest revenue deficit for any state, if I'm right. One yeah. lakh crore plus. Yes. What is he doing? If you have a state where freebies are given, things are just given to buy votes, you're not going to go far. Right. Where are, but they've done very well. 52% GER. is a fantastic state. But they must invest. They right. must do many things. They're not doing that. They're taking the easy way out. Other Tamil Nadu should have been the leader in this country, not Maharashtra. Correct. Because the politics in Tamil Nadu is very different. So I think each state has to lead each state has to find out his own genius. Each state has to find out what could be done. For example, Goa should be, could be the powerhouse of India. Goa can be like Singapore. Why right. can't it be a business center for India? Right? So it can work. So each state can develop and have his own particular strategy, invest in what takes it forward and it can work. But do you think the traditional mold has already been set? Because suppose take the example of Goa. It's always known for, say, mining or tourism or something like that. To break out of that character, perhaps the no, look, state look, government... Look, 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 I understand your question. Yeah. The ground reality has changed. The political thinking has not. Right. That's On the, the ground, answer. you look at data, everything has changed. Politically, they haven't changed the thinking. Right. Because the political thinking is out of touch with reality and what is happening uh, in the future. Right? right. You see Bangalore only. Bangalore is so fundamentally important for India. It's India's global city. Yeah. Is among the hot spots of the world. More people know about Bangalore uh, around the world about what is happening than India. They still right. think India is a snake charmer's paradise, <laughs> cows on the street, poverty, etc. I mean, more people think that Bangalore is a Bangalore is very different. I don't know there many people in the West know Bangalore is in India, yeah. right? So, reality of what it is today economically has to be realized by politicians and aspirations, right? that is, and the policy has to change, and the policy has to change to invest in. Those areas which give you growth and high income. Right. Because at the base of the pyramid middle, we have done very well. And I think Modi has made sure that almost all Indians get the necessities of life. Right. Housing, food, water, 
toilets, you know, a mobile connection, a bank account, yeah. health insurance, food on the table, everything has been given. The roti kapda makan issue. Yes, has been Modi sold. has done more yeah. than any prime minister in India's history to give roti kapda makan to everyone. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, Nisha. Absolutely. So just the, you know, the the report summary, right? Yes. Uh, like I said before, Karnataka is a top five state in India. So just to put some numbers on the on the table, Karnataka today contributes 8.7% to the national GDP. Now, this is very interesting because we contribute 11% of the formal jobs in India. Right. So if you look at the Employee Provident Fund yeah. organization data, you know, yeah. they come out with monthly data, 11%. This is compared to 8.7% of the national GDP and only 5% of the population. Right. So, Karnataka has very robust growth drivers and it's a fiscally well-managed state. So, even during COVID, COVID came out with a recessionary environment throughout India. India, The Indian economy receded by 3%, but Karnataka was has showed positive growth in FY21. Right. We may not have met our budget expectations, but we did very well. So, it's a fiscally well-managed state. It's got all these growth drivers that are based on technology. Right. So, like MDP said, it's in a very unique position to lead India. Now, so our data shows there are some challenges, right? First, and I know we're going to go uh, into this in detail later, but there is an asymmetry in the workforce sector distribution. This is at a national level also, but at Karnataka, so if you, uh, we have a full analysis in the report, 41% uh, of the uh, workforce depends on agriculture, which yes. contributes only 14% to the GDP, whereas 21% uh, in, in industry, which contributes only 20% to GDP, and 37% in services, which contributes 66% to the GDP. Right. Now, the way this plays out is the depend the agricultural dependence income. Uh, if you it, it comes out about 93,000, whereas the industrial uh, dependent income comes out about 2.5 lakhs, and someone in services on an average earns 4.76 lakhs right. per uh, per year. Mm -hmm. So this comes out to a ratio of one is to 2.7 is to 5.1. That's an incredible skew. The variance is very large, yeah. and so there has to be a shift of the workforce from the rural areas and the agricultural areas into industry and services. So that's right. number one. Second, the industry sector is traditionally been lagging in Karnataka because the skew is so much towards technology and services. Right. So we have to ramp up uh, manufacturing on two levels. One is of course the labor intensive industries uh, where we're talking about volume uh, like garments and automobile and uh, electronics yeah. etc. And that can absorb some of the shift from the agriculture to other to other sectors where right. you can take this low skill population and upskill them, reskill them and put them into manufacturing and so industry right now third and this is a very ironic that Bangalore it runs so much of Karnataka's GDP but it is highly under invested so you invest more in Bangalore and it can really consolidate its position as a global high-tech city today it's a top five innovation spot across the globe but yeah. the investment in Bangalore is very low so I think there are several challenges in Karnataka which if addressed uh, the state can do wonders. And so I'll just quickly go through our 13 point socio-economic agenda that we yes, laid please. out in the report. Yeah. Uh, so on the human capital front, uh, uh, Karnataka has an aging population, so it needs a social security net uh, to, to, to deal with this. Education is a priority. And of course, uh, under this higher education really is a priority because if the population uh, is declining, and to maintain the economic output, you need a highly skilled workforce. And so if your demographics is aging, you, you need everyone to be highly skilled so that the economic output can be maintained. So higher education, vocational training and these aspects are highly crucial. Right. And of course, health, because if your population is aging, then you're going to face other types of health problems. And so the health infrastructure has to be ready to absorb this. So this is on the socio front. On the economic front, we have a nine-point economic agenda, which I'll quickly go through. First, of course, is agriculture. Now, Karnataka is doing well in agriculture, but to really give the farmers the income they deserve, I yeah. think exports is required. Right. This is because if they're catering to the domestic economy, it's a three trillion economy. But if they're catering to the global economy, that's a 95 trillion economy. Right? Right. So the expansion is a 32x expansion. And so the farmers can really realize more of this value. Second one is, of course, in labor intensive industries, like I already mentioned. Uh, the third one would be infrastructure we need to spend on construction. So we need our supply chain costs to go down. We need better railway carriage speeds, better road connectivity. Uh, we have to connect our ports, airports. So much can be done there. And this construction is a very good way of absorbing that um, 
excess uh, workforce that's in agriculture. So you can employ them in, in construction all over the state. The fourth would be a systematic urbanization plan. This comes back to the government's be beyond Bengaluru plan, yeah. right? Don't, uh, do, uh, right now Bangalore is absorbing all this population because there are opportunities are less uh, elsewhere. So you take mm. 200 of Bangalore's towns and you develop them and then suddenly people can go there and find jobs there instead of everyone moving to, to Bangalore. Bangalore. So urbanization is going to be a huge growth driver for Karnataka. The fifth one would be Niti Aayog has come out with an exceptional aspirational districts program. Right. It's already bearing fruit in so many districts. Uh, because Karnataka is a forward state, there are only two districts in this 115 district plan of Niti Aayog. So we are saying why, why don't we start a CM aspirational districts program here take the bottom 10 districts, bottom 15 districts and uh, you know consolidate the resources there and then suddenly they will be growing faster than the state economy right. which is a big plus for everyone. After that would be high tech uh, manufacturing, huge value add here. So we have to focus on that because Bangalore is already a leading technology provider. Uh, Bengaluru on its own is a huge growth driver, needs a lot of investment. So that would be the seventh here. The eighth and ninth uh, of our so, um, economic agenda would be IT services and startups. Invest more there and asymmetric returns. Right. So really this is our 13 point socio-economic agenda. And so we can, I think this sets the context for uh, the rest of the interview. Absolutely, it does. And forward. in fact, you've already answered a lot of the questions that I had. So I'll just ask a few of the questions that I had in my mind while you were explaining yes, this. Yes, please. Now, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, spreading uh, such development outside of regions like Bangalore and increasing the industries there and employing the local population over there, maybe to an extent you can still do that with cities like Hubli, Darwad, Mysore and all of these districts. But when it comes to, uh, you know, regions like Karyana, Karnataka, you see that the economic growth and the progress over there in terms of its social indices as well is staggeringly low in, in terms of its comparison to other districts, especially also because it's quite far away from Bangalore. So, you know, in terms of that, what can we achieve? Because there are multiple efforts laid at a state level and at a national level to overcome that. But I don't think we've seen any productive change in Look, that sense. I firmly believe Hubli Darwar should be developed as the growth node for North Karnataka. Right. If Hubli Darwad develops to the bigger city, there's constant activity, entire North Karnataka will develop. Right. Now, South Karnataka has got Bangalore, Mangalore, uh, Mysore, maybe Shimoga, right? Yeah. So, it is developing very well. There is a draw. People can travel, people can go. Now, what does North Karnataka have? UP, I mean, Hubli Darwad has not developed. So, make Hubli Darwad right. the growth driver. Create better infrastructure all across North Karnataka. You need better roads, more roads, faster roads, better rail systems, etc. Having a high speed rail from Bangalore to Hubli is very good. Yeah. And then you need to incentivize the creation of labor intensive industries. North Karnataka has got people, it has got land, it has got water, it has got power. Why can't we have labor intensive industries there? Set up large industrial estates, incentivize the creation of jobs by giving you know grants for uh, industry based on the jobs they create. And if you do that and you create maybe 500,000 jobs in five years, right. uh, like this FMCG park that Ulas Kamath and uh, Chief Minister Basaraj Bombay yeah. has done in Hubli, uh, all across that area, you will develop that area. Then you've got to improve the educational infrastructure. Yeah. For example, Vishweshwaraya University, ask them to set up a campus somewhere, let us say, uh, in, uh, in Belgaum or Hubli Darwad. Make Hubli Darwad a national educational hub. It's an educational hub. Make it a national educational hub like Pune is, Bangalore is. Right. Get the for top five universities from all over India to come set up shop there. Get uh, 200,000 students from all over. The GR in North Karnataka is 19. South could be 45, 50. Yeah. Because the future lies in a highly educated, productive workforce. It is just not there. So invest in human capital in that area. So please remember, the economic strategy in North Karnataka has to be different from South Karnataka. Right. Bangalore has to focus on high tech. Yeah. Bangalore has to let go labor intensive industries to the north. Right. Bangalore and Mysore have to become part of the Bangalore agglomeration because both are highly rich in human capital. Yeah. And then the north has to grow with Hubli, labor intensive industries and then we need manufacturing in Bellary. Bellary is the second or first largest steel manufacturing base in Karnataka. Right. And then, you know, we got to set up more higher education institutions. We got to build better infrastructure because Hubli is connected to uh, Mumbai and Pune and then Hyderabad nearby and Bangalore. Yeah. Right. And then we got to create a, 
a Suvarna Karnataka expressway from Breeder to Bangalore with a spur going to Karwar and a spur going to Mangalore so that the entire manufacturing base there exports can go to right. uh, uh, go east to Mangalore and uh, Karwar. Today most of the exports can go to Chennai. Yeah. Why should you go to Chennai? Because they not build a good road to the mountains, uh, to the hills to Mangalore. We have a rail that Correct. takes 10 hours to go to Mangalore, right? Yeah. You get 5 yeah. hours by road and the road is uh, destroyed. You know that uh, guard roads have been destroyed. Yeah. For 20 years they have not been able to fix that. I don't know. Yeah. How can it work? So, you have to have a different strategy, for, but you need a local hub. See, the decline of Eastern India happened in the decline of Calcutta. West has developed because of Bombay, Pune. Right. North is developing because of Delhi. Yeah. South is developing because of the Golden Triangle of Hyderabad, Bangalore and Chennai. What yeah. is there in the East? Calcutta. And Calcutta has declined every year for the last right. 40 years. So the East is not growing, should yeah. growing at the pace it should and pull India up, right? Yeah. So you see all these things happening. North and South Karnataka are very different with each particular study, and this is the reason. Right. Yeah, I mean, and being far away, the, yeah. I mean, Kalana Karnataka is 1000 kilometers from uh, Bangalore. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I was at uh, Chief Minister Bombay in Hubli, and I asked him. On the stage, we had uh, Chief Minister Bombay, we had uh, Jagdish Shatter. We had Prela Joshi and we had uh, Ballad and uh, we had the Nirani uh, industry minister I asked him, you are such fantastic, you are such fantastic leaders in North, in, in Hubli. Correct. Why is the North not come up? I said, we don't have the local leaders in Bangalore. Local leaders, Bangaloreans who become le political leaders. Exactly. Name a few of the same caliber. Yeah, nobody gets to the state level. Ah, he said, no, no, we're all staying in Bangalore. We're all concentrating in Bangalore. We're all doing this. So I guess it's been ignored because Bangalore is uh, everything, right? You know, everything grows here. People want the comfort of Bangalore, yeah, right? And the economic benefits of Bangalore. I mean, even the story is very similar. Uh, if you look at the development in the Northeast, I think they've been uh, a little independent because the government has pushed for development. Like if they were too dependent on Calcutta, maybe the situation would be as bad as it was five, six years ago. Or Absolutely. Something like that. Uh, a slight deviation, but in terms of the tax collections, it's been a very interesting story. Maharashtra, which was at an upper echelon, has now reduced and Karnataka has, uh, you, you know, sort of gone up in that frame. So, the general citizen's behavior is completely changed after GST. So, I just wanted to get your thoughts on how it's revolving, you know, with that. No, no, last year well. in the budget, I think uh, Maharashtra overestimated collection, Karnataka right. underestimated collection. Okay. Look. We have a fantastic finance secretary in ISN Prasad in Karnataka. That man is brilliant. He's been finance secretary for seven to eight years, maybe more, multiple chief ministers. He's yeah. a brilliant man. He managed the finance very well. All right. He underestimated the collections and yeah. he's gone up by about 15%. And if you look at the target for this year, 22, 23, he's just some three or four percent higher than what we achieved last year. Right. So this year also we'll overshoot. Whereas Maharashtra, because of political instability, they didn't budget well. Okay. But you know, uh, so that is the reason, it's a very technical reason. Okay. But if you look at GST collection, I think Maharashtra has got 10 crore people or 10 and a half crore people. Right. Uh, the collection is 23,000 crores last month. Karnataka is 10,666 crores. Right. Tamil Nadu is 9,500 crores. Gujarat is 9,200 crores. Tamil Nadu has got a bigger population than Karnataka. Yeah. But consumption in Karnataka is much higher because the service economy is created high quality jobs. Right. But Maharashtra has got a much bigger population and Bombay is a major consumption center yeah. and real estate being very hot there, financial service being hot there, that is pulling Maharashtra up. So what I would say is, what is the state collection per capita all across India? Own state collection per capita based on population, not absolute numbers. There Karnataka I think should be number one. Right. Because there's a report in the Hindu business line which celebrates everything Tamil Nadu does. The Tamil Nadu has overtaken Karnataka in a own state uh, tax collection in the first six months. It is true, marginally, uh, that's because the population is much bigger and the economy is coming up again. It's a big manufacturing place. Right. To me, the big disappointment has been Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu and Bengal. Mm. Tamil Nadu has got everything going for it. 52% GER, a yeah. port, 10 big cities, manufacturing base, etc. But the vicious politics there, this communal right. politics, Dravidian politics, doesn't allow them to have the vision. Right. What is the difference between Chennai and Bangalore? Bangalore welcomes all outsiders to come and settle down. Yeah. Everybody, the best of India comes here. Will yeah. the best of India go to Chennai? The culture is very parochial, right? Very local yes. and parochial. They're right? very scared to go there. Yeah, yeah. And, and the politics also is very parochial there, right? Yeah. It's not welcoming to the outsider. Yeah. Bangalore is so welcoming to the outsider, the global city. Yeah. And Chennai should have been there. Tamil Nadu uh, should develop. If Tamil Nadu comes up, 
that would be another big growth engine. And yeah. look at Bengal. I mean, Bengal, there has been a deconstruction of industry for long. Yeah. Even the Mamata Banerjee has come, things have improved. The politics there, the fights there. You have people like you know, that Mahua, Maitra, and they say only abusing others every time in parliament and other places. Yeah. I mean, if you go on abusing people, you have Dharnas, Mochas, you have abusive language, only fight for who will come there? Why will people invest? Yeah. I used to go to Calcutta as a, you know, when I was president of IMA in many years and talk to everybody about everything. Everybody was very gungo about technology, but I said, are you going to invest? Said, no, we're not going to invest. Why? We yeah. don't want to invest in the state. People themselves don't want to invest. But even Karnataka is not bereft of that uh, native identity politics in that sense. No, no, but I see, think it's see, also see, see. They're not as bad, but... No, no. Political rhetoric is the same there because politicians are not able to demonstrate what they have achieved except for Prime Minister Modi. Yeah. Prime Minister Modi achieved a lot. He was very clear what he did in Gujarat. Right. And they got to show. He's very clear what he did in India and he has shown. Right. Here yeah, the politicians are not able to. For example, like Nisha said, 11 and a half lakh jobs are being created in the formal sector in EPFO data. It's the highest for any state. 10% of all the jobs in India have been created here in the formal sector. Yeah. So there are not jobs in Karnataka. Yeah. The problem with Karnataka is that much of the jobs is given to outside, outside the state because they come here for jobs. Right. They qualify the skill. Why didn't you spend money on skilling the local population? Why didn't you create policies to create jobs in North Karnataka? Right. Why didn't you have better education in North Karnataka? If you do all that, it will, you know, it will happen. Instead of that, they won't say, no, no, we'll have reserve, we'll do this. Because for them, it's the easy way out. Just yeah. pass a law and say, reservation, oh, we have done something. It's going to be positive, it's not going to be positive. It's the lazy solution. It's a lazy solution. Right. But they got everything going. Jobs are there. Train people and give them the jobs. As a factor of stress, the aging population is also a concern. And going forward, uh, I, I, th I don't think we've ever looked at this at a state level. Uh, so do run us through the data and you know what are the possible solutions to turn this factor around? Absolutely. So I think the National Family and Health Survey just came out in 2021 and it shows a stark difference to what the uh, image was about India both globally and nationally. Right. Everyone thinks you know we have this huge demographic advantage going forward yeah. but the data does not support that. Now the fertility rate, total fertility rate in India has already come down to 2. Right. Which means we are officially below replacement. Right. right? Now, for ec uh, emerging economies, the replacement uh, re fertility rate is supposed to be 2.1. Uh, we, are, we are below that. And Karnataka, and in fact, most of the southern states are way below that. We are more like uh, Japan or other OECD countries, right? right. Karnataka's fertility rate is 1.7. And That's really you know, the, if it follows this trend, it will be 1.5 by, by 2030. Okay. So we are definitely an aging population. Our senior citizens, 60 plus um, percentage, as a percentage of the population, uh, th this uh, senior citizen population is already at 10%. It's, to, it's going to go up to about 15% in 2030. Yeah. The 18 to 23 year population, which is the real demographic advantage, that is coming down. It's coming down by 2-3% every year. So we are definitely aging. And yeah. that is going to be a problem if we don't institute the policies right now. So what can we do about it, yes. right? One, we need a social security net, like I mentioned before, yes. to take care of the aging population, to make sure they have the health services required, uh, to make sure they have all the amenities, and so that they're not uh, bereft of help going forward. When old, Two, yeah. we, our human resource development has to go up. Our uh, gross enrollment ratio in higher education is only 32%. Right. We are the lowest among the southern states. Yeah. Everyone else is above 35%. As MDP mentioned, Tamil Nadu is already at 52%. Mm. We're definitely lagging there. So if we are able to work on developing our human capital through higher education, through specialization, through vocational training, yeah. through upskilling, then we really have a chance to ensure that the uh, aging population, so mm. our, our uh, workforce is going to reduce. But they're still able to pump out the economic output, even though the population is is aging. So it's definitely a concern. But I think with the right policies, we should be able to manage. Do you think NEP as uh, you know NEP being implemented is perhaps a positive factor towards resolving something like this? So I think yes, it's a very positive factor because it uh, liberates the university from the clutches of the bureaucrats and gives them freedom. Right. It reduces the curriculum load on people. Yeah. It forces young people to think and ideate and to become problem solvers instead of rote learners. Yeah. It gives more time for young children to experiment and do projects and come up. It gives flexibility to young people to decide upon the courses. So it's Correct. beautifully designed. It's fantastic. It's got to make it work. The problem is making it work. Yeah. And what are the biggest roadblock? Faculty. Most faculty are set in their ways. They're not going to change the ways easily. It's going to, and management will have nothing to do with them. They're right. very difficult. 
because they exchange very slowly. So they have to change. So yeah. we need new institutions like Chanakya University to set a trend where you start ab initio with the NEP and other yeah. universities to come up and hopefully they'll be the role models. But that definitely is a big, big breakthrough. After 35 years, we have a new policy. New policy. Right. 35 years. Yeah, it feels completely different. I mean, some of us graduated just two, three years ago. And now when we talk to the students who are getting enrolled, it feels it's like uh, a completely different system in place. Obviously, there are loopholes and all of that. And uh, hopefully the government will uh, take steps to address that. Uh, going, uh, you know, as far as beyond Bengaluru is concerned, uh, do you think it's, it's just stuck at a visionary level and beyond that there's no... Uh, you know, proper solutions that are proposed to make sure that the industries get spread across and, and the economic diversity is... Look, uh, Beyond Bangalore has three components. One is labor intensive industry to be set up in North Karnataka and proper incentive program is work in progress. The FMCG park has come up in Hubli, which uh, Chief Mr. Bomai has done, which is very good, and the rest have to come up. The second, which has had to happen, is improving the human capital development institution like higher education, which yeah. is still a long way to go. The thinking is there to make Hubli a national education center, yeah. and that will be improved. And in technology, they have this Karnataka digital mission, which is fantastic. They've been talking about beyond Bangalore for the last 20 years. I know about it because since 94, I've been talking to government. Right. And you know, yeah. uh, you know, so I know about it. And every time they say go to go here, we we set up uh, Infosys in uh, Bangalore in uh, 2000 and 1994. Right. Nobody followed. We set up uh, in Mysore in 2000 and invested a lot of money. Nobody followed. So very less, they're not grown because the rhetoric is here. In Mangalore, they still didn't give us a road next to the campus for many years. We operated in a building with no power connection through generators uh, because the benevolence of Dr. Ramdas Pai for many years. And then all the ministers, yes, yes, yes. In Karnataka, the beauty of Karnataka is go to a minister. They're always supporting. They're yeah. always positive. And they always have meetings. Everybody nods their head, but work doesn't happen. It's a classic yes minister. <laughs> no, but it doesn't because the good people, I don't know, because they have to be tougher and more ruthless, I guess. Right. To crack the whip and make things work. Try doing in Gujarat under Prime Minister Modi. Mm. There's you no know, three strikes, four strikes, you're out. Yeah. So you gotta be you gotta cut next. Unless it won't work. The bureaucracy will work only when you when they know that they're gonna be hurt. Otherwise they will not work. They'll pass the buck. That's been the tendency, the slow moving organization. Yeah. So I think is very important to do these three things. Now this uh, Karnataka digital mission has come. They're setting up uh, incubators, hopefully in Hubli, in uh, Belgaum and other centers have come up. The next one year, I think we'll see substantial uh, focus. And politically, we have to take a big decision. That's why I hope the next budget will really push this agenda forward. We need right. to develop North Karnataka for Karnataka go forward. I've taken a lot of your time, but before we conclude, I just uh, want to know what are the possible challenges going forward, especially because we've gone through a pandemic and we never saw that coming. Uh, so, uh, you know, what are the factors that will potentially pull the vision down uh, of achieving a trillion dollars by perhaps 2032 or something? And what are the positive advantages that we have as of now? So definitely, I think if this trend of investing in the agriculture and rural sectors at the expense of the industry sector, the services sectors and the yeah. urban sectors continues, then, uh, you know, we're going to find it very hard right. to continue growing at the rate that we want to grow. Right now, what has happened is uh, Bangalore has kind of organically grown, grown into in this economic powerhouse, yeah. but it needs support because it can't keep going if the infrastructure remains like this and, you know, all the, if the whole population in Karnataka wants to come here and there's no support for them. So definitely there has to be investment in the urban sector and when you again you know when we talk about urban sector we're not talking about just Bangalore we're talking about Correct. you know uh, Karnataka has about 250 census towns pick 200 of those towns put uh, you know develop them right from the beginning put uh, metro there put uh, affordable housing water yeah. sanitation renewable energy put everything there and then people will automatically start gravitating there. Put the industrial clusters next to them right. so that people now don't have to move out of their villages. They uh, travel 10 kilometers and they find work in these industrial clusters, in mm. these food parks, in these uh, you know food uh, processing plants. So every, we have these strategies, but there needs to be investment behind it. There needs to be policy behind it. And it has to be done ASAP because we want to see the fruits in four, five years when we want to reach 500 billion. We want to see the fruits in six years when we want to reach one trillion. Right. So I think really the time is now and the budget needs to start showing these changes if we want to see Karnataka mm. grow economically. See, like proper policies, better governance, political will. We, Karnataka can go three to four percent more per year in nominal terms. Absolutely. Right. And that will be the difference in reaching a trillion dollars and not reaching a trillion dollars. Yeah. Because that, that's we, something need that we, yeah. we need particular strategic intervention 
like labor intensiveness in North Karnataka, development of Hubli and Darwad, better educational facilities, right. creating a fantastic logistic network here, developing Bangalore as a high tech city, uh, improving the mobility in Bangalore. I mean, Bangalore requires 500 kilometers of metro. Yeah. 500 kilometers will cost you one and a half lakh crores. Money is available. Get the money and do it. Yeah. Have a big vision. You should have a metro station uh, within one and a half kilometers of your house all across Bangalore. It's not difficult. Because what are the biggest challenge in a metropolitan mobility? Correct. People have to move. And you need public transport. Buses cannot do it because you can't expand the road. Yeah. Today in Bangalore, we got one crore vehicle, 65 lakh two-wheelers, 25 lakh cars. I mean, the two-wheelers have to come down, they clutter up the road. Yeah. We need more buses. And buses remain constant, 6,500 for maybe the last 10 years. Why can't we have 10,000 electric buses in Bangalore? Yeah. And, you know, make it up well. The government has to give a subsidy, give a subsidy. So the cost comes down, people go by electric buses, they don't go by this. And expand the metro in another five years. Create 500 kilometers of metro, it pays for itself. Because productivity of people is important. This is a growth engine. So do that big, we need to think big. Money is available. Money yeah. is not a shortfall. Thinking is a shortfall. Understanding is a shortfall. And that's what has to be. Now we're going to have elections. Yeah. Now the report will be prepared. Uh, maybe the BJP and uh, Chief Minister Bombay will do it. You know, suppose some other political party comes. What will they do? Change. Bangalore yeah. will still grow. Bangalore's momentum will still be there. But the strategic intervention that they have to do to change the course yeah. of growth and accelerate growth, that is critical. And that's why... All across political parties, we have to change the thinking. I hope that happens. That's yeah, the biggest thing. This takes me back to the conversation we had when, you know, it was continuously raining and there were potholes all around the city. If you haven't checked out the, that conversation, please do. We'll put a link in the description below. That was a fantastic conversation which went really viral because I think Mr. Mohandas Pai was speaking as a Bangalore resident more than anything else on that particular day, which is why the expressions were very, very organic on that day. Uh, sir, thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Thank, thank you, you so sir. much for thank joining you. us and giving us your time. It was a lovely interview. Thank you so much. Thank you.